great that that is our personal back. And I uh, just want to go to Deuteronomy chapter number uh, uh, 12, to, I'm sorry, 10 tonight, Deuteronomy 10, listening to the microphone. Um, Deuteronomy chapter number 10. We're going to start in verse number 12. We've been, uh, we started on Wednesday nights a study in the book of Romans and we focused in on the first couple phrases that Paul says there, and he says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, he calls himself an apostle, and he says he's separated unto the gospel, and so we kind of talked on the idea of being a servant and what it meant to Paul and, and the different definitions of the word servant there that he used, but as we came into the Christmas season, we began preaching on the Sunday morning of December 22nd, and then Sunday night, we looked at the idea in Psalm 127, who is this King of Glory? With God, we said that the answer was Jesus Christ himself is the King of glory uh, that Psalm 127 describes. And so if he is the king and we are his people, we are his servants. We are uh, his, the servants of the most high king or the king of glory. And so in Romans 1, 1, where Paul says a servant of Jesus Christ, I've just been dwelling on that thought. And so I was reading in my Bible and just was kind of looking around and reading different places I had highlighted. And I came across Deuteronomy 10, verse number 12. And the Bible says, What doth the Lord require of thee, but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes. And I just began thinking on what is it that mean, what does it mean to be a servant? And what motivates our service for the Lord? And if we begin this new year on a Wednesday night, and have opportunity to be in church, I thought that would be, it's, it's appropriate that we look at the idea tonight of a servant and that we look at what motivates us as servants. I kind of, uh, just looking in these verses 10, uh, 12 through 22, we find a lot of different things and I, I believe we'll see some things about a servant. So I just ask us tonight, are we a servant? Do we really see ourselves as a servant or do we just like the idea? Uh, is it a pious sounding topic? And when the pastor comes up and talks about a servant, we talk about being a love slave to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we say, Amen. You know, how, there is no greater position, but in reality, are we living that? Are we living like a servant? Are we living like a love slave to the Lord Jesus Christ, willing to do or go through whatever it is that He would allow us to go through? And, and I know for some of us, this year hasn't been easy. We've lost loved ones. There's been some ups and downs. But through it all, our, I would pray that we all come to the end of the year saying, God's been good to us. God is faithful to us. And, and even in the transition of our church and all the different things that have gone on, looking back two and a half years on things, we can only say God's been really good. God has been faithful to us in the two and a half years that I've been here. And so we, we need to continue moving forward saying God has been good in the past and God will continue to be good in the future. How can I serve him? So look in, in uh, Deuteronomy 10 with me, and let's just read 12 through 22, and then we'll look at some different topics, and, and you may break it down in different ways. I might have more than you do um, as far as different ideas or thoughts in these sections, but it's kind of, as it came to mind, put it on paper. In verse number 12, Deuteronomy 10, the Bible says, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee, but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I have commanded thee this day for thy good. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God, the earth also, with all that therein is. Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people as it is this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. For the Lord your God is God of gods, and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty, and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. He doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow, and loveth the stranger, in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. He is thy praise, and he is thy God, that hath done for thee these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. Thy fathers went down into Egypt with threescore and ten persons, 
And now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for a multitude. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you help us tonight, Lord, as we look at the truths that we find in this passage and as we compare them with other um, examples that we find in Scripture tonight. I pray, Lord, that you will open our eyes to the idea of being a servant, a love slave to the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory. Lord, that it may not just be a phrase that we would ascertain to or that our minds would be able to grasp and that we would think is such a great title, but that we would live it out in our lives each and every day for your honor and glory. Help us tonight. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Notice, first of all, I believe the requirements of a servant are found in verses 12 and 13, and we've read it twice. And so we'll, we'll just break them down. He says, number one, that we would fear the Lord thy God. And so if we're going to be a good servant, we're going to serve God out of a pure heart. We're going to serve as a servant should. We're going to have to fear the Lord our God. And we can look at other verses in Proverbs 1, verse 7. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so as I begin to fear God, as I begin to understand who He is, and, and I, I stand in awe of Him, the, the Creator of the universe that simply speaks it into existence, the God that, that not only rules and sustains the expanse of the universe, but He chose to bring His only Son to this earth to die on the cross for your sins and mine, and we stand in awe. And as we fear the Lord, it's the beginning of knowledge. We begin to understand Him. We have the Word of God and we begin to study it. We begin to understand who He is and the fact that He loves us, that He cares for us, and He deserves our service. And He says, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so those that would despise the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, some Christians, we just get tired of it or we just kind of fall out of fellowship and we don't feel like being under it. And the Bible says fools despise the wisdom and instruction. And so we need to be careful that we don't become fools. we got to keep our hearts tender and have a desire to be taught and to understand and to be able to take in more understanding and wisdom. Proverbs 9.10 then says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So it's not only the beginning of knowledge, it's the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge leads to wisdom. Uh, but it is godly knowledge that leads to wisdom. It allows us to have the heart and the, and the mind of God, to be able to understand and to have the wisdom of God as we take in the Word of God. And so it's the knowledge of the Holy, he says, that is understanding. As I continue in the Scriptures and as the Holy Spirit is inside me and He is the teacher and He leads me in all righteousness, I begin to understand things only because the Holy Spirit is that teacher. And then Psalm 111, verse number 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. And so we, we see that in Psalm 111, it, it kind of brings these two thoughts together. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of understanding. It's the beginning of knowledge. But those that do God's will have an understanding that others don't. And people may look at you and say, well, how can you go to church three times a week? Uh, isn't there so many other things to do? Yes, there are a lot of other things that we could be doing tonight. But there's nothing like being in God's house with God's people under the preaching of God's word and singing the songs that we sing. You'll leave here tonight and, and it'll be, you'll be better off for it. And you can say, well, the pastor says that because he's a pastor. No, I know it because I've sat where you sit. I know what it's like to come in on a Wednesday night tired and wore out from a day's work and to be refreshed by the singing of the, of the songs and hymns that we sing, to hear the Word of God preached to us and to walk out of here saying, man, I'm so glad I was in God's house tonight and the Spirit of God spoke to me. And so we fear the Lord our God. We need to come to an understanding that He is God. He is the master, and, and I owe him my service. I, he deserves to have me in church tonight. He deserves that. If he bought and purchased the church with his blood, and that is his program for this time frame, I ought to be where God wants me to be. Right. Number two, we see that we ought to walk in his way. A servant not only fears the master in the sense that I am his, I am his servant. He is my master, but then I need to walk in the ways of the master. And so the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And so we can get off on our own program. We can think, well, I'm a servant. I've been a servant a long time, and I've been serving the master so long. He just kind of given me my own ability to do what I want. He can trust me, and I just do what I do. He doesn't check up on me, and we kind of get off the beaten path, and we can get ourselves into trouble. 
And so what I would encourage you to do, and we bought you a Bible reading calendar, stay in the Word of God, stay in the path of God, stay in the way of God. And, and this year, if you'll lay it out and say, listen, if, if the most I do is, is what, the, what the church is going to do, we're going to read through the New Testament in the first six months, and we're going to do the Psalm in the second six months. I'm going to commit to doing that. And we can't commit to doing it six months at a time or a year at a time. It's going to be a day-by-day -day thing. I get up in the morning and this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to start my day off. And if we'll do that each day, we'll come to the end of the six months or the end of the year and we'll have done it. But if I just start without now, I'm going to do this for the year, there's a good chance that I'm going to fail. But every day I've got to get up and I've got to walk in the way of the master. And that's what a servant does. They wake up as a servant and they walk in the way of the master. The third thing that we see there in verse number 12 is that we are to love him. And the Bible tells us in 1 John 4, 19 that we love him because he first loved us. And if you think of a master-servant relationship, what master loves their servant? And I would say, I would say that there are masters maybe that have had good servants, that have been such good servants that they... They've really learned to appreciate them. Maybe they love them in a sense of a child or a family member. But in this sense, God loves us. And he showed that love to us before we were, uh, we understood our, our servant relationship to him. Before we became sons of God, he sent his son to die for us. And so we love him because he first loved us. It's a natural response to the love of God. And then he says that we serve him, the Lord thy God, with all thy heart and with all thy soul. And, and it goes back now to the love thing. God wants us to love Him. He wants us to serve Him out of love. Not because I have to. Not because my arm is jerked behind my back so tight. I have to do it. Okay, mercy, mercy. I'll do it. I'll do it, right? We do it to our little brothers or sisters or to our sons. You're going to do it. And, and we force them to. And God says, I don't want to force you to do anything. I want you to do it out of a heart of love. I want you to respond to my love for you. And I want you to serve me out of a heart of love. Not as a robot, but someone that loves him. And then he says, lastly there, in verse number 13, to keep his commandments and his statutes. We don't keep it because um, to be saved. We keep it because we are saved. I'm his servant. He purchased me. I'm a love saved slave of the master. He deserves my service. Excuse me. And so I ought to serve him. And we do it not because... Uh, uh, not to be saved, but because I am saved. It is not the ceremonial law that he's talking about to keep the commandments and the statutes. He's speaking of those principles and statutes, the commands that enable us to live pleasing to him, uh, pleasing in his sight, and that bring glory to his name. Um, go quickly, look at Romans chapter 6. Um, Romans chapter 6 and verse number 4. We're saved, and, and we ought to walk, the Bible says, in newness of life. And we, we understand that. We use this verse normally for uh, when we're talking about baptism uh, or, or in salvation. We say in Romans 6, verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. And we've made mention of this in, in baptism service. He's not talking about water. He's saying that I am buried with him. That old man is buried and, and baptism, I, I am immersed into the body of Christ, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so I'm immersed into the body of Christ, My, that old man is dead, is put to death, and I am now raised to walk in newness of life. But now look in chapter 7 and verse number 6. He says, now that I'm saved and I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I have the Holy Spirit living inside me. Verse number 6, Romans 7, he says, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. And so you see, we walk now in newness of life, but we serve in newness of spirit. That old man that is a rebel, we look at our world today and we say, why are we going down the path we're going? We lived in a free nation for so long. We're based on Christian principles. How are we where we are today? Because of this. They have an old spirit, an old man, and they're simply following the way of the old man. And so for you and I that have a new man, a new spirit, we, we can't understand it. But it's just a natural thing for people that don't have Jesus Christ. They don't have the spirit of God. And so they're, they're unhappy and they're rebels against anything that is good. And so back in Deuteronomy chapter 10, we see the requirements of a servant. Uh, that we need to love him. We need to walk in his ways. We need to fear the Lord our God. And we need to keep his commandments and statutes. 
looking at verse number 14, we see the blessings of a servant. He, it begins in verse number 14, Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord thy God, the earth also with all that therein is. Um, and so God owns everything. It's, it, it is the most prestigious master that we can serve. And again, I, I, in our minds, I want us to think of why do we serve him? What is our motivation to serve him? And it ought not to be that we're looking to get something out of it. But on the other sense, it is only fair for us as well to look and say, I am a servant of the most prestigious master that there is. But along with that ought to come a heart full of uh, thanksgiving, a heart full of, of praise and worship for that master that we serve. And so he says in verse number 14, Behold, look, understand, take in this thought. That the heavens are God's. Well, you look around you and you see the sky and you see the birds. And, and we go out there tonight. I said to Brother LeVon, I said, it, it's a, such a clear night. You can see the stars. You can see the moon. There's no cloud cover. That part of the sky that we can see, the vastness of it, we can't even see it all. It belongs to God. But then he says, the heavens, I'm sorry, and the heaven of heavens. So outer space, where the astronauts go, where we shoot rockets to, where the moon and other things are outside of our, our gravitational pull and things that we are, are learning more and more about. But then he, he is, owns even beyond that. And it's just incredible to think that that is my master. And so anybody that says, hey, I serve a master, I serve this master, and, and our world is going by saying, I serve nobody. But in reality, they're serving themselves and they're serving the devil. And we serve a master that is so much greater than that. And he says, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord thy God. How prestigious to serve God. Not just the sky, the atmosphere, and space, but the abode of God. It is all his. And we get to serve him. In verse number 15, we see that he chooses well. The Bible says, only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them. And he chose their seed after them. Even you above all people. As it is this day. Again, to think that I get to serve the God of this universe. I get to serve the creator of the universe. And he chose the nation of Israel when she wasn't a nation. This began in Genesis chapter 12 when he called Abraham and Abraham responded. But now he's chosen the church. This age, church age, the age of grace is what he has chosen. That's his program for today. For today. And he says, whosoever will may come. Romans 10.13. That is his program for today. And so as we respond to the gospel, uh, we become a servant of Christ. And that is what he has chosen, that those who respond to the gospel will now be a servant of his. And we say, man, I get to serve the God that owns the heavens. I get to serve the God that owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And so we see the response, verse 16, of that servant. He says, circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. And so the idea is that we would cast off the old man, the flesh, and that we would live for Jesus. Uh, again, we see that he says of your heart and that our heart needs to be cut away from the things that would draw us away. The things of this world, the things of, of, of pleasure, the things that would draw us away from just a relationship with God without with pursuing him in the new year, without pursuing him every day of our lives. We need to cast that off. It's an operation completed by the Holy Spirit as he cuts our heart away from those things. And he cuts us away from those desires that would draw us away from our relationship uh, and that fellowship with him. It happens at the moment, moment of salvation. And so what I believe he's saying here is that we need to choose to live in reality of who we are. I've been circumcised. I've been cut away from the flesh. I've been given a new life. I'm a new creature in Christ. And so therefore, I ought to live like it. And we notice he says there, give the Lord, verse number 17, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords. Uh, and, and he's saying in verse number 16 that we ought to uh, live like that and to be no more stiff-necked. Uh, I think the same thing goes back to what he was telling Paul, quit trying to kick against the bricks. Quit trying to buck the system. Uh, soften your heart and respond to the leading of God in your life. And that comes at the moment of salvation as we follow the leading of, of, and the calling of God. But it happens day by day as we know God is calling us. God is leading us. God wants us to draw closer to him. And so we need to soften and we need to respond to that drawing each and every day. It's so much better for you. It's so much better for us to serve the master, to yield to his will. 
every day. Uh, you can imagine, again, being a servant under a harsh master. Um, you can make it as hard as you want to make it, or you can make it as easy for yourself as you can. <laughs> that guy is on their way to jail. I say, you can make it hard on yourself, but you're going to jail tonight. So you can make it hard or you can make it easy. You and I can do this, or me and my buddies can do this. It's going to be a whole lot better for you just to sit down in the car. And so the idea here is respond to the Holy Spirit. It's so much easier to just allow Him to work in us and to give in to Him than to harden and to be stiff-necked. Notice the character then in verses 17 and 18. The Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons nor taketh reward. He doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow, and loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. I believe the character of the servant is a reflection of the master. As I am closer to the master, and as I learn more about my master, and as I yield to his leading in my life, and as I fall in love with my master, in a servant-master relationship, he is still such a great master. He's such a good God to me that I, I want to learn more about him. I want to serve him with a pure heart. I want to serve him. I, I want to know what he's thinking. I want to be able to be a step ahead of him. And it simply reflects our master. As Christ came to this earth, right? Again, Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love toward, toward us in that while we were yet sinners. I was a sinner. But Christ as a servant came to this earth. A step ahead, before I even knew I needed a Savior, He provided salvation for me. He finished the, the work on the cross that I needed to be redeemed to God the Father. Now as I've accepted Him as my Savior, I've become His servant. I want to serve Him ahead of having to be asked to do it. I want to learn what it is that He wants of me, and I want to be able to do it without being prodded and asked and told to do so. So it's a reflection of the Master, but it's also reflected in the Master. Again, that he died for me before I knew I needed it. But on the, in the same sense, Philippians 2 tells us that he humbled himself. He became a servant to you and I. He became a servant to mankind so that he could redeem man. And yet the Bible tells us in verse number 17, he is the Lord your God. He is God of gods. He is Lord of lords. And sometimes I think we say it so often that it just kind of doesn't begin. It begins to not mean so much to us. But when you begin to reflect on it, I've been studying Daniel chapter 2 for our next Sunday school lesson. Um, Lord of lords and God of gods and the most high God is what Daniel keeps telling Nebuchadnezzar. Trying to get into his mind that Nebuchadnezzar, you may be the king of the biggest domain on this earth. But there is a God above you that is God of all gods. He is king of all kings. And Nebuchadnezzar, although you may, may be the most powerful king on this earth. There's a king that you need to answer to. He is sovereign over you. And so he is the God of gods. And notice the, the small g gods and the small l lords. There are many of them. There are multiples of them. And yet they're small and many because they don't reach the majesty of the one true God. He is the one true God. A great, the Bible says, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. Uh, he can't be bought. He can't be paid off. And we see that happening in our system right now too, don't we? In our government. We have a president that has all the money he needs. He doesn't have to take a salary. He doesn't have to play the political games of the Democrats and Republicans. He can't be bought. Um, and God says even, even far beyond that. If we, can, if we can see that in our own government system today, imagine God that owns the universe, that is the God of the heavens of heavens and heavens, has the cattle on a thousand hills, spoke these things into existence, all the multitudes, the gallons and gallons of water in the ocean. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need some king. He doesn't need politics. He can't be bought or paid off. And the Bible tells us there in verse 18 that he is uh, just and he is holy. All are treated equally and fairly according to the response to him and his offer of salvation. It says he doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and the widow. You know, there are people that will look down on somebody because they've had hard times. Maybe they're homeless. Uh, maybe they don't have a dad. People make fun of them. Whatever it might be. And God says, listen, I take up their cause. I take up their position. I am the just and holy God. All are, treat, treat, yeah, all are treated equal and fairly by the God of God. 
And then we see that he is merciful, he's compassionate, he's loving, he's patient, he's kind. Verse number 18 and so much more. You could just continue to list things all night long about our master. Notice in verse number 19 and 20, I believe, the responsibility then of a servant. He says, Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave, and swear by his name. So we see the responsibility of a servant of God. Uh, we are to love the stranger. And so I look around, there's a lot of strange people in here to love. <laughs> I'm probably the strangest of them all. No, that's not what he's saying. He says, love those that are around you. Love those that you might look on as a stranger. But, you know, we tell our kids, don't talk to strangers. But in the sense of this, we need to take the gospel to the world around us. We are strangers in this earth. And he's saying, hey, lots, there are lots of people that need the word of God. Love ye therefore the stranger. And again, my mind goes back to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. As he left heaven's splendor and glory, as he left the side of God and came to this earth, what were we? A whole bunch of strangers. We were some strange and peculiar people to him. But now he wants us to be as saved people, to be strangers to this world, to be peculiar to this world, because we ought to be different. We're serving a new master. Again, Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love toward us in the while we were yet sinners. We were a mess. We were a wreck. We were strangers. And yet God loved us, and so he wants us to love others. And he says they were strangers in Egypt, and we are said to be strangers and pilgrims in this world. Hebrews 11, 13 says that they, in the hall of faith, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 21, Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from the fleshly lust which war against the soul. So he's saying, listen, hey, you've got a master that is great. Your servant is. Live differently. Be a pilgrim and a stranger in this world. And notice that we need to fear the Lord in service. Uh, he says there that we would, in verse 20, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God. Uh, we need to serve him because there are so many things that draw us away. I think we ought to fear, serve in fear of being drawn away from this great master. Of not being there and yielded to him. Uh, he says, clear, uh, cleave and swear. I believe he wants us to affirm allegiance to him. That is my God. That is my master. And I want to serve him. And he says in verse number 21 and 22, the understanding of the servant. He is thy praise and he is thy God that hath done for thee great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. And so the understanding of the servant is that he is thy praise. And again, I mentioned Sunday morning, Psalm 147. Praise ye the Lord, right? Praise is good. Praise is comely. It is, it is a proper thing to do. Psalm 149 says, Praise ye the Lord. Psalm 150 says, Praise ye the Lord. He's put a new song in thy heart. He is thy God. He has done great and marvelous things. And so as we pray, we say, Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you for what you've done for us. Um, and so as we see there in verse number 22, they went into Egypt with three score and ten persons. They go down into Egypt as 70 people. And now they come out as a multitude of the heaven for mul uh, 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 the stars of heaven for multitude. And it's believed to be over two plus million people came up out of Egypt. They go in as 70 people and God told them, I'm sending you down there and I'm going to multiply you and I'll bring you back out. And so as we see them coming out, we see the greatness of God and what he's done. And so he, they didn't just sneak out. They came out with great victory. And so we go back up to verse number 13 and notice those last three words again. What's he say? Serve the Lord thy God for thy good. He's a good God to us. And so I ask this. I know it hasn't been the most uh, flowing message maybe tonight. But what motivates our service tonight? What will motivate your service in the new year? Is it all about you and what you get out of serving God? Or is it the fact that we are a servant and we simply uh, relinquish ourselves to that position of serving God? Many times I believe our prayer life and our attitude reflect our motivation. We're down in the dumps. What's wrong? Well, you know, this happened, and this hasn't happened, and, you know, and blah, blah, blah. God's been good. God's been good. No matter what's happened to us. The story is told of Harry Hopkins, who was an American social worker. He was the eighth Secretary of Commerce and one of President Franklin D. Roosevelt's closest advisors. According to a report, Wendell Wilkie once asked President Roosevelt while visiting him in his office at the White House, Mr. President, 
Why do you keep that frail, sickly man, Harry Hopkins, at your elbow? President Roosevelt responded, Mr. Wilkie, through that door flows daily an incessant stream of men and women who almost invariably want something from me. Harry Hopkins wants only to serve me. That's why he's so near to me. Hopkins was not concerned with what the president would do for him. Instead, he was waiting on the president, eager to serve him in any way he could. Let us who claim, right, to be the servants, the low slaves of Christ, be a servant. And tonight, before we close, I, I, I am struggling with the flow of it, but go to Job chapter 1 with me. Go to Job chapter 1. I want us to see, just with thought, what motivates our service for God. Job chapter 1, look at verse number 9. As we come out of Deuteronomy 10 and we just see what a great master that we serve, we see the responsibilities of a servant, we see the response of a servant, what we ought to be in light of who it is that we serve and the fact that we are a servant. Look in Job 1 and verse number 9. Satan answered the Lord. God says, hey, have you, have you, um, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, oh yeah, I've, I've considered him. Verse number 9, Satan answered the Lord and says, Doth Job fear God for not? Does he, does he fear you for no reason, God? Does he just serve you because he's a servant? I don't think so. Verse number 10, Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. So God is saying, listen, I've got this servant that is a servant. Sir. He is a master servant. He loves me with all of his heart. He is the servant of servants. I, I can't ask anything more of this man, Job. And Satan says, listen, God, he only serves you because you've blessed him. You've put a hedge of protection around him. You've blessed him with kids. You've blessed him with, with property. You've blessed him with all kinds of uh, provision and everything else like that. But if you'll take those things away from him, God, he'll curse you to your face just like any of your other peasants or servants would do. And God says, I, I don't think so. Look in uh, verses 21 and 22. Uh, man. Anyway, so God lets him take it away. Um, then Job, look in verse 20. Then Job arose and ran his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground, and what? Worship. He still loved God, but Satan still has taken everything away. Job's response, verse 21, he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So God now can stand there and say, Look, Satan, I, I've proved it to you. I allowed you to take everything away from him. And what's his response? He still loves me. He says, naked came I into the world. Blessed be the name of God. He's still a good God. He's still a good master to me. If I don't have anything. Look in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. God allows uh, Satan then to take his health away. In verse number 9 of, of chapter 2. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain, retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Why? Because he was a servant of the Most High God. He understood his relationship to God. God is his master and he is simply a servant. Come what may, God is still good and I'm still just his servant. And I, I, will, I will settle with what God gives me. Now go to Philippians chapter 4. Let's see it in the New Testament and we'll close. Philippians chapter 4. Look in verse number 11. Paul says, Not that I, I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who has strengthened me. So we see the same idea, the same attitude. God is the master and I am the servant. If God gives me plenty, if God gives me a lot, good. If he takes it all away, he's still a good God and he still deserves my service. Good, bad, 
God deserves my service. I've learned, he says, to be content. God is sovereign. He knows what is best. Whatever the master determines for me, I know that it is best, and I will serve him for part of me. That is our reasonable service. That's what Paul says, right, Romans 12, that we would give him, that we would be a living sacrifice, a servant, by reasonable service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father,